thank you very much for uh, coming out tonight. I know there are probably other things you want to do. I will say uh, at 9 o'clock tonight is a great PBS series just starting on Native Americans. So if this uh, piques your interest a little bit, I would really suggest at 9 o'clock uh, that you go home and watch that. Uh, there's three more after that. It's supposed to be excellent. Uh, I'm going to talk for about 30, 40 minutes or so, and then we'll have a chance for some uh, questions along the way, then, and uh, we'll get through some of the basic stuff here, uh, get you oriented then. And if I can get this moving, let's try this button then. Well, just to tell you who I am, um, I'm a retired clinical psychologist. Uh, what's a psychologist doing exploring 17th century history around here? Well, I started about 15 years ago uh, by doing a, a website on the King Philip War, uh, which was uh, very interesting and really got me into some of the local history. And I thought I'd, I knew everything there was to know about the 17th century after doing the, uh, all the different war sites around here. Um, I also got involved over in Warren, where I live uh, with the Hugh Cole Well site. Okay. That's behind the Kickamuit Middle School. If you ever want to go over there, it's on the bike path next to the broken bridge on the Kickamuit River. Uh, but uh, this sign is no longer there. They keep stealing it. <laughs> you know, we've given up. <laughs> it's not even metal. <laughs> they take it anyway. Uh, but uh, when we did that, uh, uh, kind of um, uh, reopening of, of that site, the town added uh, some wonderful interpretive signs there. So you can read all about Hugh Cole, who uh, we'll talk a little bit about later, but uh, uh, just that was my orientation to kind of what was out here in terms of the 17th century. But when I retired uh, a year ago, I uh, got in touch with a woman named Helen Drader. T-J-A-D-E-R, who was living in Barrington and had done a presentation at the Warren Preservation Society on songs. And I went to that and I remembered it, so I called her up and I said, Helen, what's going on with the Soames Heritage Area that you proposed a few years ago? And she said, well, not much of anything. <laughs> uh, it was a good idea, but we haven't really put it into action. So. She made a video with uh, a, a young fellow who, who does uh, great nature photography. I'm going to just show you one minute of that video. The other three minutes are on the website if you want to see the whole thing. It can be argued that Soames is the pivotal place of cultural exchange between indigenous people and colonizing settlers in North America. Few people realize that there was a peace treaty between the Poconoke tribe and the Puritans established around March 21st 1621, which lasted over 50 years. One idea to consider is the establishment of a Soames National Heritage District, which could provide a framework for an appreciation of Soames and the role of the Poconoket in the heritage of our country. A Soames District could provide an encompassing approach featuring the essential cultural, natural, scenic, historic, and recreational open spaces of Soames, in a way that celebrates this layered history for residents and draws new visitors. If we begin now, we could ensure that the Soames Heritage District is well established before the 400th anniversary of the peace treaty in 2021. She can't be here tonight. If, uh, if she could, she would be, and uh, we'd hear from her on this project. But I stay in touch with her, and um, she's really, uh, provided the inspiration for this whole uh, project. Um, and if you understand what she said in that one minute segment, uh, she's talking about uh, us re-recognizing the tribe that was originally here when the pilgrims arrived. Now most of us know the word Wampanoag, right? And we think, well, it's the Wampanoags who were here. Well, if you get into the history and you get to talk to the people, the tribal members who are still here, you understand the word Poconoke. You've heard her say Poconoke. Anybody heard that word? Yeah. This is the Poconoke tribal territory. 
called uh, in the home of Massasoit, who was Pocanoke. The word Wampanoag was assigned to the Poconoka tribe after the King Philip War because the English wanted to expunge all Native Americans from here. And if you said you were Poconoka or you spoke the Poconoka language and you were over the age of 12, you could be shot on sight. It was that serious. So anybody who was Poconoka stopped saying they were Poconoka. And they adopted this kind of generic Wampanoag term. But the Wampanoags include people on the Cape who are not Poconoke, okay? And even people in uh, northwestern uh, um, Rhode Island who are not Poconoke. So this is the Poconoke territory. And if you can see from the map here, it includes both the islands, but not the Cape where the Mashpees are. And all the way into Providence, Okay, and, and west of there, and not the Narragansett territory that we're familiar with. Because the Narragansetts and the Mashpees are both federally recognized. Those are the people we hear from. Those are the people who often you know, talk about the Wampanoag history and things of that sort. But they don't talk about the Poconocans who were in this area, not Narragansett, not the Massachusetts, not the Nipmuc or the Pequots. Um, and the area that the Poconocans occupied um, is what we call Somes, runs from the Taunton River over to the Seekonk River, and loosely translates as the southern area of um, New England, really. If you can't go any further south, you'll be wet. <laughs> uh, so this was the Poconoca territory, or what we call Somes. So the Somes heritage area includes all of this. So who was here 12,000 years ago? The same people who are still here today, <laughs> okay? The, the, the people who moved into this area after the glaciers receded somewhere around 12,000 years ago uh, began <laughs> hunting and gathering here and began making their home here. And it's that continuous occupation of this land for over 12,000 years that we're recognizing in the Soames Heritage Area. Um, Things were fine, <laughs> people survived, ate quite well as we understand because of the abundance of uh, fish and uh, clams from the seashore and cleared areas that they would burn off the land and plant there and hunting in the woods that were also uh, cleared through, through hunting. Uh, so it was a terrific place to live. And then some boats showed up in the 1500s. Okay, you're smiling because if you're European, those are our, your boats or our boats. I'm, I'm English by heritage. And these are the folks who came over here, partly because from the traders who came here in the 1500s, they learned that this was a pretty nice place. Though the Mayflower, as you recall, was really headed for New York. Okay, then the, because of a storm and they, they couldn't get around uh, Cape Cod and ended up in Plymouth. And what happened when they arrived in Plymouth? Who was there? <coughs> Nobody. Who had been there? Hundreds of people. In 1616 to 1619, uh, a series of uh, diseases brought by uh, those traders <coughs> wiped out the population along the coast to the point there was nothing but bones. They couldn't even bury their own dead. How did the colonists take that? A sign from God. This must be our place. It was already prepared. There had been fields that had been planted and a whole um, uh, settlement really arranged for them. Um, what they learned to do is to trade with people uh, particularly for furs. Uh, furs were very popular in Europe in the early 1600s. Uh, they used to make hats out of beaver, uh, out of the, uh, what's the guard hairs of beaver, okay? Uh, so there was a demand in Europe for beaver. And though the, the Plymouth colonists thought at first that they were going to come and trade fish and wood to take back to England, which had um, no wood, <laughs> 
uh, and uh, make their money that way. But they soon learned that because of an agreement they had with Massasoit, uh, they garnered the trade routes uh, so that the Native Americans brought furs, particularly beaver, down to them, and then they would trade in Europe. That kept them alive. So they went from an agricultural community that was quite successful. You consider uh, they've lasted 12,000 years here. How long have we been here? Not even 400. How are we doing? <laughs> Some people would say not so well. <laughs> okay. Uh, so uh, along with trade came disease. Um, huge, uh, probably 70% of the, the Poconoca tribe, particularly along this coast, was wiped out. Not the Narragansett tribe. It didn't cross Narragansett Bay. But because of that, the need for protection, because the Poconocans were um, always uh, at odds with the Narragansetts. The Narragansetts wanted to move in and acquire this rich, beautiful land. Now the Poconocans had few people, few warriors available. So Massasoit did the smart thing. He went and talked with the pilgrim leaders in March of 1621 because he knew they had guns. Okay? And he said, you protect us, we'll protect you. And that's how it worked. In fact, they created a treaty known as the Wampanoag Treaty, even though that's misnamed, um, with Osamequin. We know him as Massasoit. Massasoit just means chief over chiefs. Uh, but Osamequin, and we don't know what he looked like. He was described as a tall, lusty man. That means muscular. But this is the statue in Plymouth. This is a more contemporary painting in, in which he's wearing a red jacket given to him by Winslow and a copper necklace that figures in uh, a little later. But uh, the whole point of their meeting was to establish a treaty. This is uh, someone's imaginary uh, drawing of uh, what that uh, uh, meeting might have looked like. Uh, and those of you who collect coins may have uh, a Sacagawea dollar coin. Well, if you do, flip it over. On the back side, it commemorates the Wampanoag Treaty of 1621. As far as I know, it's the only time the U.S. government has ever acknowledged the Wampanoag Treaty. Okay, but it's there. And we use that as our, kind of our symbol, even though it says Wampanoag. The guy who made all the connections principally was Edward Winslow, uh, who was on the Mayflower and kind of took a liking to this guy Massasoit, figured he was the one uh, to talk to. So he traveled down to Psalms. Anybody want to guess where he might have met uh, Osamequin down here, where he was living at the time? Bristol. Pardon me? Bristol. Well, a lot of people think Bristol because King Philip had a seat there, and we know there was a settlement there. But it's not likely that he was that his father, Osamequin, was there at the time because of some of the descriptions of the story. You can read the whole story; it's it's fabulous uh, in m many pages and a lot of detail about that visit, how they traveled, where they went. Any other guesses of, as to where he might be? If it wasn't in Bristol. Where else? If you were living, <laughs> if you want to live somewhere in, uh, down here in the, of the East Bay, where would you go? Pardon me? Yeah. Barrington, of course. Yeah, that's where all the best houses are, right? <laughs> of course, so he was living in Barrington. We think on Tyler Point. It's, it's just conjecture. We don't know for certain. We know he lived somewhere in the area at that time. And we also know that the villages, the settlements, were moved from place to place depending on the season and the, the availability of wood and um, animals to hunt and things of that sort. Um, Winslow came back again um, in, in 1623, and I'll tell you about that in a second, but uh, the people in Warren, uh, particularly Virginia Baker, back in the late 1800s, started arguing that uh, Massasoit must have been living in Warren because there's a spring there. So they dedicated the Massasoit Spring, and you can see that at the end of Baker Street in Warren. And if you look at the town hall, the frieze up on, over the top of the town hall says, 
Psalms 1621 and has an Indian with a Western Indian headdress on it. Uh, that building was built, I think, 1888. Uh, and people were quite convinced at that point that that was the home of Massasoit. And then uh, uh, Thomas Bicknell came along later and uh, 1898 said, no, it was Barrington. And he wrote all the, all the arguments for the visit taking place in Barrington. Either way, it doesn't really matter. We know for certain that the Massasoit lived close by here, okay? And probably traveled right through this area, the, what was then called Mattapoisett, uh, the Gardner's Neck Road, was, uh, is, a, is in the uh, description of how, we, uh, how they traveled there uh, from Plymouth. So, two years later, and there might have been other visits, none recorded, um, Winslow comes down because he's heard that Massasoit is ill. And uh, he comes and visits him in his um, Witu, or Longhouse, and cures him with what sounds to me like a recipe for chicken soup. Um, but um, within a day, um, uh, Massasoit, who had uh, lost his eyesight, and you know, his tongue was swollen, and he, you know, he was just in bad shape, um, was so grateful that he recovered after Winslow's treatment that they became friends for life. And that friendship lasted until um, Massasoit's dying day in 1661. And that cemented along with the written treaty this long-standing relationship. It's all described in this book, uh, Good News from New England, uh, published in uh, 1624, I believe. Uh, so everybody in England was reading about this. Fascinating kind of stuff. And you could read about it anytime as well. Um, I want, someday, we're going to do a reenactment of these visits. Uh, I've been talking with people, we've got it mostly figured out in terms of when and where. Remember, the, the Plymouth 400 anniversary is coming up in 2020. Well, we want to do a reenactment in 2021 and 2023 and involve people in this neck of the woods. Everything didn't happen in Plymouth, right? <laughs> Okay, so if you want some idea of what this area looked like, I just took a Google map and erased all the buildings and put trees and fields in there. Um, what we do know from the descriptions is that there was a trading post uh, open probably again in, in, on the Tyler Point shore in uh, Barrington, um, similar to the Hoxie House that's now you can see down in the Cape. Um, but um, a lot of the land had been cleared by burning, it burned twice a year, uh, for planting, but also for hunting. Um, so you can shoot your deer uh, without having them uh, hide behind uh, the brush. The woods then are nothing like the woods now. Now it's just a jungle of all kinds of stuff. You can't walk 10 feet through it. Okay, back then it was like a park. Okay, huge chestnut and oak trees, um, just a wonderful place. So, here we are in this gorgeous place, Miles Standish, uh, on the Mayflower. You all remember Miles, he was their, one of their military guys. He comes down here and he says, God, this place is gorgeous. We want this land. Okay? Um, he called it the Garden of the Patent, the patent being what the king had given them, the, the land and the flower, though he spelled it F-L-O-U-R, <laughs> of the garden. He meant this is the best place of all. He had not seen any place better than Soames. Okay? And it stands to reason that the English at that point were looking for places to farm and to uh, uh, let their cattle and their pigs and their sheep graze and things of that sort. It couldn't have been any better than what they found here. Well, other people started tromping through the area. You all remember Roger Williams? Remember he got kicked out of Salem for his radical ideas? Okay, in January of 1636, they were about to come and get him and put him on a ship and send him back to England. And he <laughs> snuck out three days earlier. He had been down in Plymouth for uh, more than a year, got to know Osamequin as he often got to know the Native American people all over the area. And he knew that that was the place to go. 
So even though it was January, one of the worst winters they had experienced then, he tromped his way from, uh, from Salem all the way down here, met Osamequin in his winter encampment. Now, in the wintertime, they would move away from the shore. It was colder and not so accessible uh, to uh, food and fish and uh, clams and things. So they would move inland. And yesterday, uh, we had a group, uh, again, that went back to the um, Margaret's Cave, uh, which was, it, it's just over the line, the Swansea line. Uh, you, you can't go there now because it's on private property, but the Williams family uh, leads groups there. This is the, the cave that people believe that Osamequin's people sheltered Roger Williams in that winter from the time he arrived here sometime in January to the time he left in April. He was deathly ill and describes in one sentence how he had, hadn't had food or uh, a decent place to sleep uh, in all that time. And now Osamequin and his people take him in, at, and there, we believe there was a, a whole settlement right around there. It wasn't just he and Margaret, there were a lot of people there. Uh, so uh, Roger is nursed back to health and leaves and goes where? Not directly to Providence. You have to stop at Omega Pond because Osamequin said you should go up on the Seekonk Plain. It's a beautiful place along the Seekonk River and settle. Um, uh, the river. This is a little in, it was an inlet, now it's closed, so it's a pond. Uh, but uh, you can visit that place. Anybody been there? Mm -hmm. Good. Hardly anyone knows where it is. There's a little tiny sign up on a telephone pole, and that's it. And this monument is set way back. This is how it reads. Um, so you wouldn't notice it. Uh, we've got to do something about that. Uh, but that was a critical place because that's where. He brought his wife and child down and several other people to settle with him there until, uh, not Winslow, but Winthrop from Boston said, you've got to get out of here, okay? Because um, we own that territory. So even though he had his crops planted uh, and he was ready to build houses and the whole thing, that would have been Providence. Uh, he gets on a boat, goes across the river, uh, they greet him, uh, what cheer me top, <laughs> and uh, he eventually establishes a small settlement. And, and Providence remained a small settlement for quite some time. Uh, Newport was really the capital. Newport, back in the mid-1600s, was bigger than New York City, okay, which was a little Dutch outpost, okay. Uh, Newport was where it was happening around here. Uh, so Providence really didn't rival them. But at that time, but became uh, known for the place where people with radical ideas go. If you weren't getting along with the, uh, the powers that be in Boston and that surrounding area or in Plymouth, you could always go to Roger's place and he'll take you in. Okay? And we could do a whole evening talking about all the radical ideas and the Quakers and everybody else that nobody wanted. That's in part why I believe Rhode Island was sometimes referred to as Rogue's Island <laughs> because of all the people uh, uh, who didn't believe the way everyone else did. You can still see a couple houses in East Providence. This is from 1690, the Daggett House and the Philip Walker House from about 1679. The best place to learn about Roger Williams is down at the Roger Williams Memorial in, in Providence. Uh, there's a great, uh, small, but uh, very good interpretive center there. It's open seven days a week. Um, year, well, I think you're around. Um, uh, this is an a artist's rendition of what the early province would have looked like. The state house would have been up here on this hill. This great salt pond got filled in eventually with a railroad. But we still see a remnant of it if you go to water fire down there. That's still the same water that was there uh, that comes up the Providence River. And of course, now we have College Hill and lots of buildings. And uh, there, unfortunately, there are no pre-1700 buildings left in Providence. The closest you can get is uh, one house from 1707, I believe. Um, everything burned during the King Philip War, so there was nothing left. Um, I'd, I'd like to include the Waybosset Bridge. I never understood how Providence was laid out. You don't understand 
the configuration of Providence until you notice that the Wewasset Bridge was the one place you could cross from the western side of the state to the eastern side. Um, they used to wade across there at low tide, but they started building bridges. This is the eighth bridge that was there. And guess who was the toll taker on the first bridge? None other than our friend Roger Williams. You gotta make a living somehow. <laughs> uh, I won't go through this in any detail, but if you get some idea of the changes in land ownership. Uh, remember we talked about beaver trade and furs? Well, guess what? The fashions changed in Europe in the early 1650s. Suddenly nobody wants a beaver hat anymore. So when the native people bring beaver furs to people at Plymouth and said, you know, we need to trade for knives, we're dependent on the knives and axes and bowls and everything else, You've been supplying us. In fact, to the point, we don't even have anybody anymore who remembers how to make tools out of stone or shell. That's gone. That technology is gone. We need the European stuff. And the Europeans said, we don't want your furs. Nobody will pay us for them. What's the one thing they have left? Land. And starting uh, back in 1645, bit by bit, 53, 67 with Swansea, okay, and then several iterations. This is a very confusing kind of thing because there are parts of Swansea that uh, changed hands and part Warren included part most of Barrington but then got split off in 1747. Very complicated. It's taken a long time for me to understand all this. But the bottom line on all this is that all the land north of Bristol Rehoboth, remember, was already purchased in 1643. All this land came into colonial ownership with small exchanges, you know, 15 pounds here, you know, uh, one thing or another. But, um, of course, we understand that when the native people were selling their land, quote unquote, they weren't selling it the way Europeans buy land. They were selling the use of the land. You can hunt here, you can fish here. You can cut uh, um, salt marsh A here. Um, whereas the colonists said, no, this is ours. You can't come here. This is our land. And we're going to graze our animals, our sheep, our cows, and our pigs. And oh, if they get loose and they ravage your, remember the three sisters, corn, squash, and beans that were growing? Too bad. It wasn't us. It was our animals that did it. Well, one thing led to another, and then what happened? <laughs> Um, over in Warren, we believe, um, somebody shot a cow, one of the Native Americans, and we'll talk about the King Bell War briefly. So in 1643, if you're familiar with East Providence, which I knew nothing about before I started this project a year ago, that was the Ring of the Green and uh, the group with uh, uh, Samuel Newman who uh, brought folks down from Weymouth uh, to that area. So. You began to have people who were settling all through this area. Where were the native people now? Confined down here in Bristol. And they were surrounded, not just north of here, but you've got Providence and you've got uh, Smith's Castle down here and uh, Warwick and uh, North Kingston. Um, you had people down in the Quidnick Island. They were basically surrounded by Europeans by the, the mid-1600s. Things were not going well. Uh, they had suffered a smallpox epidemic in 1632 that wiped out even more people. Their population was diminishing year by year. The European population, on the other hand, was increasing. Remember, uh, 10,000 people came over in the 1630s to settle Boston. By the time the, of the King Philip War, there were over 50,000 Europeans in this area, and probably less than 2,000 Native people left. Okay? Uh, big changes. So, the King Philip War. I could do a whole program on the King Philip War, and Carl could probably do the same if you probably already had that presentation. But uh, needless to say, it was a vicious war. Uh, 25 of uh, the colonial towns from Bristol all the way up to uh, uh, Deerfield in Massachusetts were burned. Um, they almost succeeded. Uh, by about December, 
uh, things were not looking good for the colonists. And if that war had continued, and if the native people hadn't run out of food and ammunition, they may have driven the English back to England. Okay, it was that close. Um, there was a great swamp massacre, uh, a lot of terrible things that happened in that war. Uh, eventually, uh, Benjamin Church started adopting uh, guerrilla, guerrilla warfare tactics of the native people. They didn't fight by standing in the line the way the English did. They shot from the woods. Um, so Church started doing that and he began to succeed in lack of ammunition, lack of food, and change in tactics uh, by the following summer for certain. Uh, the, uh, it, things were going uh, in the English uh, favor. And eventually, uh, um, Philip was chased back down into, uh, or he fled anyway, <coughs> down to uh, uh, Montauk, to uh, Bristol, uh, where he was, he was shot. Um, nonetheless, by a Native American. Um, um, and um, the people who were remaining were either, if they weren't killed in the war, um, they were enslaved, or, and many of them were sent to Barbados, okay? Uh, for, uh, to be enslaved there, to the point that they would say, I'd rather die than be Barbados. Um, or they fled north uh, to Maine or west as far as New York City. Um, so that was why after the war, people basically uh, attempted to drive all the Native American people out of here. Okay? That's why people to this day say, oh, there aren't any Native Americans around here. Here's some familiar places. The Miles Garrison. How many have been there? <laughs> many times. <laughs> You're smiling, so I presume you know this very well. I, I won't tell you anything you don't know. How many people have been over to the site where uh, um, King Philip was shot in the crystal at Mount Oak Farm? Yeah, you can go visit there. Just go to the office and tell them you want to walk there, and they'll let you let you go there. Uh, so let me go through. Briefly, some of the places that you are familiar with. Anawan Rock, up 144. Okay. Anawan was uh, Philip's uh, kind of second in command, and he surrendered, and the church spent some time with him. There's a whole story about uh, what went on at the rock. And now I guess they, they do ghost walks up there now, because you can hear some of the things from the 1700s. Does this look familiar? Old Eddie Burial Ground. Who's been there? Okay, just two of you, all right? It's right around the corner over here. Though I went back on Ledge Road the other day and I couldn't get in there. I don't know what's happening. Yeah. It's tricky to get in. Yeah, it needs some work. But when I was looking for burial sites where at least one person uh, was buried prior to 1700, I came across uh, um, Zachariah Eddy um, and uh, Samuel Eddy. Uh, who was buried in uh, 1687. Okay. Um, that, anybody knows of another uh, burial ground that has somebody prior to 1700 in Swansea? Please let me know. We'll put it on the page. Abrams Rock, you know that, right behind the library there. Okay. Fabulous place. And all kinds of native lore connected with that. How about King's Rock? How many people know King's Rock? I know who. Carlos. How many people know Johnson's Market? Yeah. When you drive south and you see Johnson's Market on your right, then go about 50 yards and you'll see this rock outcropping there. Okay? It's a lot easier in the wintertime because there's not so much vegetation. That's King's Rock. It's on old maps there. And it's described in the Swansea Stagecoach as the national grinding stone of the Native American women. And we believe, because uh, Carl and I and uh, Tim Johnson were up there, that it's this groove down here. It's not terribly obvious, but uh, the, uh, the story goes that they had a groove in the top of the rock and they would roll a big rock over corn and grind it that way. You could take it for what it's worth. We don't have any proof of any of that. But there is a groove in the rock that's filled with lichen right now. And then across the street, across one, Route 136, on the D'Alessandro farmland, there's this big boulder. You probably noticed, glanced at it driving by. 
It's easier when some of the vegetation is down in the winter time. And then there's the spray painted signs. I got to find out who did that. I also I, I want to get the sheriff over here with his paint removal probe and get that cleaned up. Uh, so we went. Uh, I, I talked to Susan Lansmark, who owns the uh, farm, and I said, "Can we get on there and take a look close up?" So we went over there one day. Uh, you were with us, right? Climbed up, looked all around, and lo and behold. It's not what uh, all our archaeologist friends call this a glacial erratic. They mean the glacier moved the rock and then melted and left the rock there. And then you look at it and you go, so it put some other stones underneath the rock, huh? I guess glaciers do that all the time, right? Um, and it's interestingly located on top of this one bedrock outcropping at the top of this mound, hmm, what would Native Americans think? This was called Sachem's Knoll, and we believe, without any confirmed historical evidence, that this was a perched or balanced rock put there at some point in time by Native people who lived here because they were oriented to the stars. And they would put perched rocks up here and position them in such a way that the rock, it's a little difficult to tell from here, but there's a direction that it points in. And it tells you what to look for, the winter solstice, the summer solstice, and the movement of the stars. They were very much in tune with that. Remember, they didn't have TV. So as the sun set, you started reading the sky and telling stories, okay? Uh, so that's our story on this, that that's a perch rock, and we're going to put uh, some signage up there someday that explains all that, and the archaeologists can say what they want. A <laughs> um, couple other things in town, and I'll wrap up in just a couple minutes here. This look familiar, Carl? The Cahoon Brick. Yes. Um, <laughs> Carl, uh, is this one of, one of the ones you, you dragged out of the river? Yeah. Yeah. So Carl went and found this brick. I knew nothing about the Cahoon Brickworks. Anybody else hear of that? Yeah. Okay. Uh, and uh, it was uh, 1673, just before the King Philip War. This guy, uh, this is first name? Uh, William. Yeah. Came from uh, Scotland, right? And came over and established a brickworks. He ended up up at the uh, Miles Garrison at the outbreak of the war and went north to Rehoboth where he was living to try to get some food and help uh, from, and for some of the wounded people there and ended up getting killed by a Native American and is buried in Rehoboth now. Uh, so there's a whole story there I knew nothing about until you went and found the brick. <laughs> um, the uh, White Church, otherwise, uh, no, when did that start? Anybody have an idea? My records say 1680 it gathered. They didn't build a building. And by 1693, they had the first building. Okay. If somebody has a different story, please let me know. But that's a 17th century church. Okay. Um, you're also familiar, I don't have it up here, with the uh, Baptist church, which is, the start of that is now in Barrington over at Notton Hill. Uh, but that church building, though it's not from the 17th century, came from a 17th century gathering with Reverend Miles, uh, who brought a group down from um, um, the Newman Church and split off, started the Baptist Church. So I can get Charlie Hartman here sometime, he'll talk your arm off about all this. Okay. Uh, right. But there's, uh, there's an agreement. How about the uh, Benjamin Cole House there on Old Warren Road? Uh, I. Everything I've read said that's early 1700s, 1707, 1705. So I didn't put it on the website, but now people are telling me that there may have been some structure here prior to 1700. And if I can verify that, then we'll add that as we also did for this house, you know, the Martin House. Anybody connected with the Martin House? <laughs> Fabulous place around here, okay? And I thought that was late, early 1700s, they say, what, 1714? 1728. Uh, 28, yeah. But you told me that there were 
undoubtedly parts of that house that were built prior to 1700. Foundation. Foundation. So that qualifies, and it's a fabulous place. You can see some of the armament that people use, the type of armament anyway, uh, that people used during the King Philip War, and a, a lot of early 18th century history uh, well displayed there, including the King Philip chair, which supposedly King Philip sat in uh, while watching, um, was it uh, Cole's house burn? Because there's another story I find in East Providence that he sat out in front of a house in front of the Ring of the Green, and they've got a chair that's a King Philip chair. So, you know, kind of take this for what it's worth. That, that, the original, they now have a replica in there. That's the replica. The chair yeah. was dated yeah, these, that time period. Yes. There's no question that the yeah. chair is that old. Yeah. And it, the original, I believe, is in the uh, um, Plus, uh, Museum of Fine Arts. Right. James Wanted in there. Yeah. So we're going to have to we're going to have to get people together on the two chairs, <laughs> the ring of the green chair and this chair. It looks just like this one, though, by the way. This is I'm going to finish up with where I started, which is uh, behind my house. Uh, if you haven't yet been to Burst Hill, uh, which is right next to the town beach in Warren, uh, you will, as of last a year ago May, uh, there's now a monument there, placed there by the Mashpees, who gathered over 600 items that were removed from this site in 1913 by Charles Carr, the librarian uh, at the uh, George Hill Library. Uh, he did that because people were just stealing stuff from what was the railroad gravel pit back then and taking stuff home. And he said, I've got to get this out of here. So even though he was excavating people's graves. He did it with the best of intentions. Eventually, a lot of the stuff ended up at Harvard and Brown and the Hay Museum in New York. Um, well, and in Graveside Rec Reclamation Act of 92, next thing you know, the Mashpees, because they're federally recognized, start going to all those museums and say, we want the stuff back. If somebody took things out of your grandmother's grave and took it home, how would you feel? Not too good. Well, that's how they feel. Okay, so they got these items back, put it in a, a vault, buried it, covered it uh, with the inscription there, and had a celebration there in the park uh, a year ago, May. So we believe that um, uh, some of the, one, at least one of those grave sites uh, had uh, items from Massasoit himself. And if you want to know where the Poconocets are today, this is the Tribal Council. I meet with them frequently. Uh, they have powwows. They sometimes gather up at King Philip's seat up in, in Bristol, at, at what, what they refer to as Potomka, uh, Mount Hope. Um, and we, they came to our uh, opening event uh, when we started this uh, website project. So we're working with them. The, we're, what we want to do is restore the history around here. We want to restore the land, and we're working with land trusts and we want to restore the history of the native people here. Those are our three objectives for this project. If you want to know more, get yourself onto the internet, type in uh, somesheritageareaorg over 80 pages on there, over 50 locations described with pictures, maps, the whole thing, uh, links to other information, and it's not a static site. We grow stuff all the time. If you're really interested in this, at the bottom of every page is the place to put in your, your name and you can use a nickname, it doesn't matter, um, and um, an email address. And then when I do blog postings, about every two weeks or so, it's not going to stuff your mailbox. Um, when we do um, different events, like uh, last night we did an appearance at the uh, Takwa, uh, talking about East Province uh, Bowl Point and uh, India Point started in 1680, okay? All these things that nobody knew. <laughs> we're, we're telling people about that, and you'll get regular uh, updates as, as we go along the project. We did just get a grant from the Rhode Island uh, uh, Council on the Humanities uh, to do an education program, and we're looking for places that, uh, uh, for children, uh, elementary and middle school, who want to learn Native American history and crafts from Native Americans. Uh, the uh, people in the council, uh, the tribal council, 
will make arrangements to come and speak to groups of kids and get them involved and they can do beadwork or drumming or dancing or you name it. Uh, so that's our next project over this winter. Okay? Thank you very much. You've been very attentive.